In this complete course, we'll cover the entire animation process from making a script and storyboard through to how to share your animation with the world. To help break up the video into manageable chunks, each section will cover a unique part of the process. So without any further ado, let's show you the finished product before jumping into part one. Okay, Tilly, enjoy your bath. Don't splash around too much. Ooh, grow your own dino, friend. Just add water. I shall call him Mr. Stunky. In this video, we'll learn how to use a script and storyboard to plan out your animations. And I've got a free storyboard template for download. So let's do it. Tip tot. Hello everybody and welcome back to Tip Tut. Today we are covering two things. First, how to put together your script for your animation in a way that will make sure you've got everything you need to move forward. Then second, how to turn that script into a storyboard that gives your animators, whether that's somebody else or just you later on, everything you need to put together the animation you envision. Before I begin, I'm not saying these techniques are the be all and end all of scripting and storyboarding, nor am I saying that they're the industry standard. Far from it. I just know that they work because I've been using them for personal and professional projects for years. So without any further ado, let's just jump right in. A good script will cover a number of things. Setting, characters, props, action, and dialogue. I like to start with the name and general overview of the project. In this case, it's hilariously short. And then follow with a scene by scene breakdown. Exterior, English countryside, house, day. The clouds slowly drift above a tranquil English cottage home. A female voice, mum, calls out from off screen. Mum, off screen. Okay, Timmy, enjoy your bath. Don't splash around too much. Interior, bathroom, day. Timmy, a young boy with wide eyes, is sitting in a bath. The bath is overflowing with bubbles. Timmy is holding a dinosaur toy in a box. Timmy, go your own dino friend. Just add water. Timmy lets the dino fall slightly as he looks into the distance in wonder. Timmy. His name will be Mr. Slunky. Timmy starts tearing wildly at the dinosaur toy with his teeth. It flings open and flies into the bath water. Timmy sinks underneath the water too. After a brief pause, Timmy peeks his head out of the water just before the dinosaur explodes in size very violently. Exterior, English countryside, house, Day. The dinosaur's head and shoulders burst through the roof as it grows in size. Timmy clings to its rapidly growing neck. Timmy. Whee! The dinosaur stops growing suddenly and Timmy bounces to a stop. Timmy. Mummy, uh, I'm finished with my bath. End. In this short script, we're introduced to the setting through a quick description, as well as immediately understanding the characters and their relationship through a single line of dialogue. The action is focused around two scenes, which will cut down on animation time, as I only have to draw two backgrounds and one character. Additionally, the action here will help inform the dialogue and sound effects needed when we move on to the next steps. You can see how having a script for even something as simple as this animation helps you to line up what you'll be needing later down the line. Now, let's turn this script into a storyboard. <laughs> It's not the scriptwriter's job to choose how their story plays out visually. Although in this and most cases at our kind of level, the scriptwriter and storyboard artist are often the same person. The storyboarder cares about translating the scripter's writing to a visual format. To that end, working on a template that everyone understands is very helpful. This template, which I've been using for years, includes global information like name of project, page number, and version number, and shot specific information like the scene and shot number, camera movement, layered visuals, visual description, and audio description. I tend to find that that's enough information to be getting on with, so let's take a short section of this script and storyboard it in real time. 
The most important thing is thinking about the best way to portray each piece of information visually. For example, let's take the first scene. We need to convey that it's outside, English countryside, and showing a house. So to me, an establishing shot of the house in full view does multiple things. Establishes setting, timing, and style all in one. Once we move inside, we need to determine location, character, props, and action. A long shot of the bath does all of this in one go before moving closer to the action in later shots. For example, when saying the dialogue about growing your own dinosaur, it makes sense to use a close-up of the dinosaur toy to focus the audience's attention and better convey the information of the scene. But we also want to show Timmy's relationship to the toy, so an over-the-shoulder shot brings Timmy into the scene emotionally and physically. When Timmy is naming the dinosaur, the script mentions wonder, so an extreme close-up with a low-angle viewpoint gives us plenty of room to show emotion. Spend some time thinking about how to inject emotion, comedy, drama, etc. into your scene, and don't be afraid to redo shots. Move them around, add shots in, or remove them as you gain a better understanding of the story you want to tell. It should be an iterative process. At the end, read through your storyboard to get a sense for the timing. I like to put each shot on a slide and do a little pseudo-animatic, like this. Okay, Timmy, enjoy your bath. Don't splash around too much. Splish splosh, splish splosh. Grow your own dino, friend. Oh, good, I say. I'm going to name him Mr. Snunky. Whoa, oh. <laughs> Mummy, I'm done with my bath. credits music. I'm not voice acting or recording at this point. I'm just running through, but this immediately makes it clear if anything is missing. Once you've made those amendments, you're done with your script and storyboard and can move on to the next or simultaneous stage: character design and turnaround. Design concepts and learn how to draw a useful character turnaround. Let's get to it. Tip Tut. Hello everybody and welcome back to Tip Tut and welcome back to the how to create an animation series. Last episode we learned how to create a script and storyboard for our animations so if you haven't watched that one yet you can do so here. If you have watched it, awesome! Today we're going to talk about character design and turnarounds. <laughs> Your audience empathizes with your animation through your characters, so their design should reinforce the message you want to send. This is a whole subject in itself, so I do suggest further research, but I'll use Timmy, the character from last episode, as an example. First things first, think about your character traits, from simple stuff like, are they young or old, fat or thin, boy, girl, trans, human or animal, etc. Then dive down into less obvious things. What's their personality? Are they kind or cruel, sullen or overjoyed, stoic or passionate? Using this list of character traits, we'll design our character using basic shape theory. Here's a video on that theory. It does use logo and graphic design as the example, but the concepts are exactly the same. Timmy is young, male, bubbly, excitable, innocent, impressionable, friendly, and approachable. Certain shapes evoke certain emotions within our audience. If I make Timmy have an angular face and body, small beady eyes, a large hooked nose, and a hunched posture, well, he doesn't look innocent or approachable, and certainly not friendly. This is because sharp, angular shapes are aggressive and cruel, perfect for a villainous character, but not so much for someone who's meant to be approachable. Remember, as we learned in the 12 Principles series I made, which you can watch here, animation is all about exaggeration, so we need to take our character traits and exaggerate them to better convey our meaning. If sharp shapes are aggressive, then round, curved shapes are friendly and approachable. Large eyes, all the better for the audience to connect with emotionally, make Timmy look approachable. And a round, compressed body makes him look like a ball ready to bounce, perfect for his bubbly personality. Little details like wild hair and a big belly button add personality to the character, giving them defining details that the audience will remember. Timmy is looking much better, but let's look at him from another angle with a turnaround. 
turnaround is a looping animation of your character. They rotate in place and offer viewpoints of your character from every angle. Front, three quarters, side, back, and three quarters back are usually the minimum with some tweens to make it smooth. The important thing here is you should understand what your character looks like from any angle. So when you come to animate them later, you have your turnaround as a reference, which helps minimize mistakes and wasted time. Start with the basic shapes. Don't try to do all the detail at once. And remember that unless your style specifically calls for it, you're drawing a 3D character in a 2D space. Things like the belly button should rotate around a sphere, not a circle. So add some guidelines to help with this. Let's look at Timmy as an example, and then I'll show you the whole process for the dino. Start with the circle for the head and body and basic shapes for the limbs. When Timmy faces the front, he's wider than he is deep, so the body shape will change when he turns to the side, then revert back when he's facing the back. Do the front, side, back, and other side. Depending on your character, you might be able to copy and flip these guide shapes for the other side, but definitely don't do that for your finished art. You'll regret it later. These four basic angles form the basis for the rest of the phases. And your three quarters left and right and your three quarters back left and right are pretty much straight in-betweens, so shouldn't pose too much trouble. Make sure these are smooth and then it's just a case of adding your details. Some important details for Timmy are the belly button, as mentioned before. It should be slightly bigger in the front view as it's closer to the lens. The hair should transition from one side to the other. And don't forget that the eyebrows on the character protrude off of the head and they're not flat on it. Once you've got all that roughed out, it's just a case of tidying up the lines and adding enough in-betweens to make it smooth, just like so. Now let's look at time-lapse of the dino and I'll explain my full thought process as I go. Okay, so the dino is very simple. Um, he just consists of basically two circles uh, and some sticks coming off of him for the legs. So what I made sure to do is start with the four poses that we started with uh, Timmy the front, side and back views and then use these as a basis to create the in-between three quarter views. The most complicated thing here were his legs, um, making sure that the uh, as they moved and rotated around that they didn't cross over weirdly or anything like that. So, you know, the front left leg would then pass to become what looked like the front right leg, even though it wasn't technically. So getting that took a little bit of difficulty, but apart from that, very simple turnaround. And I do this on purpose. I try to keep my characters as simple as possible. Literally, the dino is two circles with some bits coming off of it. So getting this basic step right was really important first before I went to move on to do all the in-betweens as you see me doing now, because that just allowed me to create really simple in-betweens uh, based around two circular paths, the rotation of the head around the body and the rotation of the body in place. Um, then when it came to tidy up the lines, there was a little bit more difficulty here because I had to really pick carefully where I um, did my crossing over and intersecting lines. Uh, for example, the belly and the front of the legs and things like that. You can see me erasing and redoing these lines over and over again as I tried to figure out the best place to put them um, to make sure that it looked like his legs were in the right position, essentially, and to make sure that the fold of his belly looked like it was in front of, you know, the, the back legs or things like that. So lots of faffing, unfortunately, in this stage, but the two circle base for this character was really important in order to just keep the volume and uh, other bits consistent. And then went through and colored the back legs in a slightly darker shade of green and the body in a light shade of green to see this finished product. Okay, so there you have it. Some simple tips for character design and turnarounds, but I'll reiterate again that this is just the tip of the iceberg. There's tons of great resources out there, so do go do some of your own research. In this video, we'll learn how to create an animatic for your animation, both the animated visuals and the audio, such as voice acting and sound effects. Let's get to it. Tip tot. Hello everybody and welcome back to Tip Tut and welcome back to the how to create an animation series. Last episode we learned how to create a character design and turnaround for our animations. So if you haven't watched that yet, you can do so here. If you have watched it, awesome. Today we'll talk about animatics. You can think of an animatic as halfway between a storyboard and an animation. Whilst a storyboard helps rough out the ideas of what shots to use, an animatic helps tie down the acting, 
timing, transitions, audio, and other elements that can't be conveyed easily or accurately without motion. There are a few things you need before you get started with your animatic, so let's get those out of the way first. As an animatic should include sound and dialogue, etc., you'll need to record any of your character's lines ahead of time. If you're doing it yourself, here are some tips. Get a good quality mic, or if you're using the mic on your phone or something of lesser quality, try to pad the environment around it with blankets, pillows, soundproofing to reduce the echo in the room. Don't get too close or too far away from your mic. Too close and you'll blow out the audio or get popping on your consonant sounds. Toast, toast, like this, toasty. Too far away and it'll be too quiet and the audio will pick up echoes from the room. Like this. Isn't it echoey? I was always taught the shaka technique or shaka technique. Throw up a shaka and put your mouth on the thumb and pinky on the mic and use that to measure the distance or about 15 centimeters if you want to be specific. Record several takes even if you think you got it down on the first try and make sure to warm up. Me, 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 me. La, 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 la. My dog has fleas. Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled peppers. The Human Torch was denied a bank loan. Okie dokie. I guarantee your later takes will nine times out of ten be better than your earlier ones. Mmm, Timmy. Oh yes, Timmy, young Timothy. Okay, Timmy, enjoy your bath. Don't splash around too much. Don't splash around too much. Don't splash around too much. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, grow your own dino, friend. Just add water. Just add water. His name will be Mr. Snunky. I shall call him Mr. Snunky. His name will be Mr. Snunky. Ah! <coughs> Whee! Oh, Mr. Snunky! <laughs> Mr. Snunky! Mr. Snunky! It's voice acting, not voice acting. Act with your whole body and your audience will feel the emotion. Just look at the masters at work like Alan Tudyk. I went to Julia. Or Mark Hamill. It's that time again! Thanks for tuning in! Get ready for another round of newbies! I'm your host, The Joker. Once you've got your voice lines recorded, scour your script for any additional sound effects you might need. You can always come back and add more later as you tie down your animatic, but it's good to have the basic ones at hand so it doesn't slow you down. Sites like freesound.org are good for the generic things, and even YouTube Audio Library has some decent stuff these days. But other times, doing your own Foley is the best option. Once you've got all those sounds banked, you can start looking at your animatic. The techniques explained in this tutorial can be applied to any animation software, so we won't be talking specifics, but I'll be using Adobe Animate for the examples. You can use your animation software of choice. We'll just do one sequence in detail here, then I'll explain my thoughts as we time lapse the rest. But there's basically two important things to focus on when making an animatic getting the timing right and getting the acting right. Your animatic, like your storyboard, doesn't have to be beautiful or detailed, but it should have enough information in it to tie down every major aspect of your animation. Obviously, there'll be refinements and tweaks later on, but they'll be informed by the storyboard and animatic. Let's take this first simple sequence from scene two, shot one, to scene two, shot five. We've got an environment introduction, some basic motion, a camera transition, some dialogue, and lip sync. So let's go through these one by one, which should cover most scenarios for your own scripts. It's always nice to have some parallaxing in your backgrounds, i.e. things closer to the camera move quicker and things further away move slower. There's more on how that works in this video here. So you should layer your backgrounds in order to allow for this parallaxing effect. Here we have the sink and toilet in the foreground, bath in the midground, and wall slash window in the background. If you bring these into your animation software of choice as three separate objects, you can layer them 
and animate them separately in order to give your scene some depth. This also allows you to move things around later with much greater ease as there'll be no missing background chunks behind each object. For basic motion, you'll need to tie down the timing and the acting. In this shot, Timmy needs to notice the toy and grab it down from the shelf. Then we transition inwards. To get the timing right, you could try acting out the actions in real life and timing them. But remember, animation is about exaggeration, so you don't need to stick to it exactly. You should also only draw the key frames, or for complicated motion, perhaps the extreme frames too, which if you don't know what that means, you can watch my 12 principles episode on the subject. But basically it means the best drawings that tell the story and the frames at either end of a motion. So for this one, probably Timmy in the bath, Timmy notices the toy, reaching out for it, and bringing it back into the bath. For each frame, make sure that Timmy is conveying his excitement through posture, facial expression, etc. You might add some bouncing to each frame to reinforce the fact that he's moving with a lot of energy. Space these frames out according to the timing that you feel is right. For camera transitions, you've got a few options. Most of the time using the inbuilt camera tool in your animation software will work for basic zooms and pans, but something I like to do is a whip zoom, where your characters morph and distort over a very quick transition, which adds a bit of comedic value. For this, I like to anticipate the transition with a basic eased in zoom. This will then transition to a warped frame, often for just a single frame, then a basic eased out zoom on the new background. To achieve this simply and quickly in the animatic stage, I just use a combination of the radial blur, twirl and pinch filters in Photoshop, but more on that when we get to the backgrounds episode. Combining these techniques makes for a nice quick and dirty whip zoom transition, with of course a supporting sound effect. Finally, for dialogue and lip sync, the important thing is not to sync too much time into it during the animatic stage. Don't worry about getting an accurate lip sync. Instead, focus on the key emotive frames that get the character's overall motion and dialogue vibe down. Here, Timmy just moves the toy a bit closer to his face. His eyes widen and pupils grow in wonder. A few simple key phonemes or mouth shapes will convey everything you need to know about the shot. Remember, Animatics are functional, not beautiful. Beautiful comes later. Focus on the emotion and information of your shot. Get your characters acting correctly by emphasizing or exaggerating poses or emotion and worry about the complicated lip sync later on. Add the sound effects, such as splashing water, after the dialogue, as the dialogue is the most important thing to get right and the sound effects are just a supporting element. Let's look at all of that put together. Ooh. Grow your own dino, friend. Just add water. Okay, looking great. Those techniques cover every other shot in this animation, so I'll just explain my other thought processes with a quick time lapse and we can watch the finished animatic. So, here I am inside of Adobe Animate, and the first and most important thing to say is that um, if you've drawn something well in your storyboard and you're struggling to draw it again for your animatic, there's nothing wrong with going back and just tracing what you did in your storyboard. You'll notice me do that a few times during this time lapse because I just can't get it right. Like here, for example, I bring in Timmy, I trace his head and I trace the box because I was happy with the way it was drawn. Now, some softwares you won't actually have to trace, you can use the um, images you did for your storyboard, but I did it in a different software. So what I'm focusing on when making this animatic is mostly just emotion and timing like we've discussed throughout this entire video. Uh, I'm not worrying about the detailed animation, I'm not worrying particularly about you know even drawing the characters particularly well. Uh, I'm purely focusing on getting the emotion right. And one thing you'll notice here when I'm drawing Timmy is I start with different parts of his body depending on what he's doing in the shot. Uh, this is a technique called um, starting with the leading action. So if the leading action of him is, you know, biting open this box with his teeth, then I'll start with his face. If the leading action is him reaching out for the toy, then I'll start with his arms because that's the driving force of that action. And it just helps you um, kind of put together your character in a way that has a bit more energy, or at least that's what I've found. When it comes to um, transitioning from one shot to another, 
and you run out of you know background if you haven't drawn enough don't worry too much you'll notice in a few steps here that as i transition and move these backgrounds around i'm having to copy and paste the sky you know the clouds the sun all that sort of thing just to get it to work in the animatic stage that doesn't matter if it works it works and you can always come back and tidy up later on if you need to even simple things like just taking this background and adding some motion blur to it for when timmy's flying through the air rather than drawing a new background the whole point is you're getting a point across, you're not making something beautiful. And with that said, let's take a look at the finished thing. Okay Timmy, enjoy your bath. Don't splash around too much. Oh, grow your own dino friend. Just add water. I shall call him Mr. Stunky. Okay, so there you have it. In this video, we'll learn how to create backgrounds for your animations. We'll cover some simple techniques regarding parallaxing and talk about how to best work your backgrounds seamlessly into your animations. Let's get to it. Tip tot. Hello everybody and welcome back to Tip Tut and welcome back to the how to create an animation series. Last episode we learned how to take our storyboard and turn it into an animatic. So if you haven't watched that yet you can do so here. If you have watched it, awesome. Today we'll talk about backgrounds. <laughs> backgrounds are a chance to express your animation style in a more detailed and intricate way. We all know having textures, shading and complex shapes in your animation adds so much time to the workflow, but as your backgrounds are mostly static, you can use this as a chance to really express yourself without too much impact on the delivery of your animation. Today, I'll break down my thought process on how I created this indoor background for Just Add Water. We'll cover what to do about shots that require a moving camera, and how to situate your characters into the scene naturally. Now, if you struggle drawing backgrounds, I have an existing video on that, which you can watch here. In this video, like we've done in the rest of this series, we'll focus on how it fits into the animation workflow. So to get started, look at your animatic. This will give you a rough idea of what backgrounds you'll need per scene. You might think it's one per scene, which sounds obvious, but if there are any changes in camera angle or something like an extreme close up, you might find it better to redraw the background with a bit more detail so you can retain the same style in each shot. In this scene, for example, we clearly need a wide shot background of the scene, but when the camera moves into Timmy, we might find a simple shot of just the window with more detailed items on the window sill might work better. Next, determine if your background needs to be larger than your canvas size. For example, currently when we move to the extreme close up of the dyno, we can see the edge of the existing background sketch creeping in. Additionally, at the end of the scene, when the camera briefly shoots up to follow the dino growing, the background needs to move down, so we might need to include more of the window and potentially even some of the roof. So that's a potential of three backgrounds for this scene. Wide, mid shot of the window, and an extreme close up of the window too. To save time, and because it'll be mostly covered by the dinosaur, I'll just reuse the mid shot of the window in the extreme close up of the dino. No one will notice, or possibly even care if they do. If I show the same low detail bottles and candles and things from the wide shot in the mid shot, that might be a bit distracting. So it's worth redoing that one. Two backgrounds then, both of which need to be a different shape to the canvas, namely taller in the wide to accommodate for the upwards camera motion, and probably square in the mid shot as it'll be rotating around and we need to cover all angles. So let's get to it. For the wide shot, we'll need at least three layers because of the parallaxing we spoke about in the last episode, wall, bath, sink and toilet. But whatever software you're making your backgrounds in, I recommend keeping it as non-destructive as possible and putting everything you can on its own layer. This makes things much more flexible later on and you can always duplicate and flatten to just three images upon export. Firstly, I need to extend my sketch to include the additional information such as the window and top of the roof. So I use that as an opportunity to refine the whole sketch. 
Once I'm happy with that, I need to choose a color palette. This animation is funny, joyous, and silly, so I think lots of bold, bright, oversaturated colors will help with that. I'm using a brilliant color palette by Gigantic, the link to which is in the description. But if you have trouble pairing colors, I have a video on that too, which you can watch here. Try to pick a palette that suits the mood of your animation and then just dive in. First, do a quick color sketch of your background. Colors have a very heavy visual weight, so you'll want to make sure your colors are drawing your audience to the correct part of your background. If you don't know what visual weight is, watch this video here. I want everyone looking at the bath. Other aspects like the camera movement and the fact that the character is banging in the middle of the frame help direct the viewer's eye, but doing a quick color sketch to determine what best leads the viewer's eye towards the bath really helps. Obviously, the bath is white, so darker walls, floor, and objects will help add a good amount of contrast to the image, drawing the viewer's eye to the center. Okay, I'm roughly happy, let's move on. I want a lineless style for this animation, so I'll start out with a block base color on whatever object I'm drawing first, in this case, the bath, as that's the most important thing in the scene. Once I'm roughly happy with those block colors, I'll go and add some accent lines where we need differentiation between elements, like at the edge of the bath's rim or details on the tap. Usually I'll just use a brighter or darker shade of whatever the base color is. After block colors are done, I like to add a new layer on top using a clipping mask so it only draws in the layer beneath. I'll usually set this to overlay mode, then using a white brush for highlights and a black brush for shadows, I'll add some basic shading to my object. I do it this way so I don't have to worry about color in the next step, which is to add some texture. Using a texture brush, at the moment I'm loving this watercolor style brush that I can't pronounce in Procreate, I'll do a general light wash over the object again on its own layer set to overlay. Then I go back with a colored brush on its own layer and add some actual colored shading and highlights, which the two overlay layers make really pop. Everything gets put in its own folder and I do the exact same process for the rest of the objects. When it comes to drawing the next background, don't be afraid to move things around a little in order to create a better composition. In this shot, you should definitely be able to see the bath at the bottom of the frame, but it doesn't add much and it would be visually distracting, so I removed it. It's my animation. I do what I want. Same thing with the bottles on the shelf. If they'll all be covered by Timmy, shift them about a bit so everyone can see your hard work, if it works for the shot, of course. Once you've got your background, simply export it in the various layers you need, or just take the source file into your animation software if it supports that, and then test it in your animatic. With Adobe Animate, I can just replace the contents of each symbol I made. Easy. And that's all there is to it. Like I mentioned before, if you want details on how to actually draw backgrounds, check out this video, which focuses on that. In this episode, we'll take a look at how to make a title card for your own animations, including what information to include and ways to make them engaging and intriguing without giving away too many spoilers. Tip -tot. Hello everybody and welcome back to Tip Tut and welcome back to the How to Create an Animation series. Last episode we looked at creating the backgrounds for our animation, so if you haven't watched that episode yet, you can do so here. If you have watched it, great. Let's talk about title cards. You see a title card at the beginning of most animated shows on TV. Whilst not strictly necessary, they are a great way to tease the upcoming content and intrigue the audience, but they also serve as a way to give pride of place to the hardworking animators, storyboarders, writers, and other crew that have invested their blood, sweat, and tears into making the damn animation in the first place. Title cards can be pretty simple, consisting of just one image, or can be a succession of images, but basically serve as a pre-roll credit sequence. They have a few parameters that are usually included, so let's go through them now. They include the name of the animation, an illustration that teases the content without giving too much away, the credits, usually writer, director, and or lead animators, but can include storyboarders, in-betweeners, voice artists, etc., and theme music or a musical sting to connect the title card to the first scene of the animation. The most important thing to get right when making a title card 
is the theme. Usually, the title and credits aren't just text on a page, but rather part of the artwork itself. Take this Ren and Stimpy title card as an example. Here, Mad Dog Hoek is both the title of the animation and the main antagonist. These are tied together by printing it across a hulking figure's back, with Ren and Stimpy cowering between his legs. This gives us an idea of what the animation will be about, the name of the animation, and the main characters all in a single image. The text then flashes in and out to reveal all of the people that worked on the animation. So this is an example of a great title card with strong imagery and efficiency, which is super important, especially for a show like Ren and Stimpy, which had a budget of two pieces of wet tissue paper, an IOU for 50p, and a deadline of yesterday, goddammit, don't make me tell you again. Let's look at another example, this time from the older Looney Tunes cartoons. Here, the budget was even more shoestring. A plain colour background using actual cutouts from the episode, just a title and a legal disclaimer. Not exactly a work of art, and basically gives no information about the upcoming episode, but it is very much representative of their era and company. I love Looney Tunes. These title cards are rubbish. But they do have one thing going for them. Each week, you see the same thing, and that's great for branding. Final example, this time from Fairly Odd Parents. The older episodes would have a custom illustration with the title of the animation and a bit of repetition and branding with the prefix the Fairly Odd Parents in dot dot dot. Lower budget and efficient, which is great, but no shout out for the crew, which isn't as good. Later episodes would include pre-roll credits over a very similar style illustration, which would do a great job teasing the upcoming episode, combining the best of both worlds. Fairly Old Parents has some of my favourite title cards of all time. This is very much the era of animation that I grew up with, and the hyper-stylized art style really stands out to me as unique and engaging. So, with all of that information in mind, let's take a look at making our own title card. I think, as I'm literally the only person involved, we can dispense with the full credit sequence and just have a Made by Matthew Fryer credit. So let's focus on the title and illustration, then tack the credit on somewhere. Well, the title is Just Add Water. It's enigmatic, recognisable as a global phrase, and relates to the story without giving away any real information. So that's easy enough. For the illustration, we need to find a cool way to incorporate the key themes and ideas from the episode without spoiling the gag. Things like Timmy, the main character, the dino, water, bath, damage to the house, childhood toys. Some of these are more important than others. We want to tease, so damage to the house is a bit explicit. Let's remove that. Bath and water can be combined to just water, I think. Timmy isn't a recognisable character or brand, and I think the dino is a more powerful image, so we'll leave Timmy in the list, but I think focusing on the dino is a good idea. Childhood toys is redundant if we're not showing an environment, so that just leaves us with Timmy, Dino, and Water. These three things, coupled with our knowledge of the story, should give us enough to work with. Start by throwing ideas down on paper, rough as possible. Don't worry about merging notes and sketches at this stage, just get down anything you think could work. And remember, if you can incorporate the title into the artwork in some way, that's even better. Maybe the words Just Add Water are written in puddles of water on a tiled floor, with the dino poking in at the edge, hinting at bathrooms and toys. Maybe it's a close-up of Timmy's face holding the dino in front of him, but instead of pupils he has the title words in each eye. This is interesting and very much reminiscent of Ren and Stimpy, but there's no mention of water. How about the dino bobbing about in the bath with the title words written in bubbles? That gets the idea of the bath and water all in there at once. No Timmy though. Maybe it's Timmy's head poking out of the bottom of the frame, with the dino on top of his head and the title written above him. Good image, but the title isn't incorporated into the artwork. Not a deal breaker of course, but it is a shame. Once you've got a sketch, run with it. I won't tell you how to draw an illustration, that's kind of up to your style, but I will say this. Try to follow the style of your animation somewhat, but with a little bit of extra detail and polish. Simple and similar to the actual animation style, but a little bit more detailed, because we don't have to make it move. And that's really all there is to it. Quite a simple little tutorial today, but one that I find interesting, and it serves as a chance to show you some great title cards which are often an overlooked part of the animation process. In this episode we'll go over some useful animation tips like drawing in passes, help with lip sync and time saving techniques as we finally animate our short. Let's do it. Tip tut. 
Hello everybody and welcome back to TipTart and welcome back to the how to create an animation series. Last episode we looked at creating the title card for our animation so if you haven't watched that yet you can do so here. If you have watched it, fantastic! In this episode we'll cover some useful animation tips. Now, I've made tons of animation courses here on YouTube that cover the mechanics of animating. Beginner Adobe Animate courses, courses on animating scenes, lip syncing tutorials, wave principle tutorials, character rigging tutorials, and 12 principles of animation tutorials. So I'm not going to tread the same ground again. Instead, I've got a few tips for you that I use to get this animation done quickly, efficiently, and to a high quality. That last one, of course, is pretty subjective, but hey ho, here's a few things I did whilst making this animation that helped me and I think might just help you too. Number one, animate in passes. Don't make things complicated for yourself. If you've got a complex character, multiple characters, or a lot of secondary movement in a shot, animate them in different stages or passes. In this shot, I animated the dinosaur's block green form first, then went back and added the details, then went back again and added Timmy's block form, and then went back again and added his details. If I tried to do all this at once, I definitely would have messed up the timing and energy of the scene as I was focusing on just drawing the characters. Number two, the bounce technique. If you need to save time in your animations, especially if they're more whimsical and comedic, you can use something that I call the bounce technique to save precious time and frames. Here, Timmy is stretching for the dino. Redrawing each frame for such a small amount of movement would be time consuming and tricky. We'll probably get a whole bunch of wobbly lines as well. For this style of animation, which is quite simple, you can just stretch and warp the final frames for the smaller movements. This keeps the animation alive, saves you time, and adds a little energy to the movement. For full details on this technique, check out the detailed video on it right here. Number three, key mouth shapes first. When doing lip sync, either manually or with a set of visemes, do the key mouth shapes first. Break your dialogue up phonetically and draw the most powerful, unique, or obvious mouth shapes first, then animate between them in a way that reinforces the feeling of the sound, rather than the actual letters being spoken. This will lead your audience through the dialogue, without too much effort on your part, and without distracting them with potentially sloppy lip syncing. Number four, sometimes less is more. For this last shot, I just had Timmy bounce through two key poses. He's so far away from the camera that you can't fit a lot of detail in. So I lent into that for comedic effect, and I think having this bouncy flipbook style animation makes it a little funnier to watch. Obviously, this one's personal preference, but that is what I said I'd be talking about at the beginning of this video, so there you go. Number five, have fun. Finally, the most important tip is this, have fun with it. Sometimes, most times, animation is stressful, time consuming and tiring. You need to imbue your animations with joy and make sure that you do your best to have fun with them. Want to add in a stupid expression? Do it. Give your character a big stupid belly button? Why not? Fill it with colour, energy and passion. Obviously this all depends on the genre, etc. But the main thing is this. If you enjoy it, chances are your audience will enjoy it too. Once that's all done, you've got your animation. It's as simple as that. Animation's pretty easy, right? <laughs> Let's take a look at the finished product. Okay, Timmy, enjoy your bath. Don't splash around too much. Ooh, grow your own dino, friend. Just add water. I shall call him Mr. Stunky. So that's it. You finished your animation and you're super proud of it, but probably at the same time hate everything about it and can only notice the things that are wrong with it. Don't worry, this is normal. Congratulations, you're an animator now. But you have to share your creation with the world, right? Which is why the next episode of this series is the final episode and we'll touch upon a few ways that you can exhibit or show your animation, whether that's for free, online or in other places. In this final episode of the series, we'll go over some great places to get your animation out there into the world from the obvious to the adventurous. Let's do it. Tip tot.
Hello everybody and welcome back to Tipta and welcome back to how to create an animation series. Last episode we went over some classic tips for getting your animation finished, so hopefully you've seen that episode and are now looking at your finished product, wondering how to get people to see it. Well, let's talk about that. YouTube. Let's get the obvious out of the way first. Depending on what kind of audience you're after, there's plenty of great places to upload your animation to the internet, starting with where you are right now. YouTube is a great place to potentially get your animation in front of a wide audience, but as we all know, the almighty algorithm does make it hard for animations to become successful on the platform, especially for new channels. YouTube heavily favors consistency over quality. Channels that upload daily and get longer watch time are more heavily spread through recommendations than videos that have shorter watch time from channels that upload less frequently. Whilst this benefits the advertisers and YouTube's bottom line, it's not super great for many content creators, especially animators. Although if you hit that common ground of quality and consistency, you're golden. Upload to YouTube if you want to, you might get lucky. Probably you'll be crushed by the weight of a billion channels spewing out content of questionable quality at incredibly fast rates. New Grounds Newgrounds is one of the OG animation websites, and whilst it has a much smaller audience than YouTube, I'd argue it's the better place to upload because that audience is largely there for one thing, animation. You're also in with a higher chance of making the front page, and once you get there, the more views you get, the longer you stay. Newgrounds isn't a particularly good website for serious animations, although they definitely have their place. Content that is of the comedy or parody genre tends to do better. People leave comments, rate your animation with a helpful five-star system, and often will spread your animation to their friends. Basically what YouTube used to be. While smaller, it still holds its ground in the online animation field. Vimeo. Vimeo is definitely more of a professional platform, primarily used for uploading content of quality, such as short films or animations, as opposed to quote-unquote consumer content. If your animation is more of a serious production, you could definitely consider uploading it to Vimeo to attract a more dedicated audience. Vimeo also punishes you less than YouTube for uploading infrequently, acting more of a content meets portfolio platform. Definitely worth thinking about. There are plenty of other places to upload online, depending on your language and location, and what audience you're after. If you know of any great places to upload, do leave them in the comments below. But consider this, why limit yourself to online? Local film or animation festivals. Why not submit your work to a local film or animation festival? You might think you're not at the right level or that you'll be blown out of the water by the competition, but if you get in at the ground level, you can have some success even if you don't have much of a standing or established work base. Again, this might be for the more serious or developed animator, but if your work connects with people, then it could do well. Then when you add to your Vimeo or Newgrounds page, you've got some nice accolades to go with it. I did this for the first ever Winchester Film Festival in 2015, and whilst I'm pretty sure I won because there weren't too many applicants, hey, I still won, and that animation was pretty shit. Well, there you have it, a couple of places to consider when exhibiting your animation. That's it for this video and for this series, so thank you so much for watching and making it to the end of the series. Hopefully you found something useful in these videos. There's plenty more content on the way, so do make sure you subscribe and rung that notification bell so you don't miss out, and I'll see you all next time on Tip Tut. Massive thank yous once again to my level two and above members, without whom Tip Tut would not be possible. You guys are super delightful. If you'd like to become a member of the Tip Tut Zone, you can click that join button below for exclusive perks and benefits. Remember to subscribe for more tips, tricks, and tutorials. Thanks for watching.